Mm-hmm. Everybody, Matchroom Radio, uh, episode 69. We're in London, England. And I tell you what, man, I got a cat here. Uh, great guest today, Malik King Scott, former heavyweight champ or former heavyweight uh, contender, and uh, he's a trainer of, of uh, a lot of great fighters. And we're going to talk about that in a second. But I was going to say he's living out in Los Angeles. Los now. Angeles, yeah. And today and yesterday, I mean, this weather—it's unbelievable. I don't know if you spent a lot of time in London, but it's beautiful, bro. Uh, <laughs> when I first got here, it was a little wet. Uh, but ever since that first night, the sunshine been out, the weather's been good. I've been enjoying it, taking my long walks, going to different libraries, yeah. cigar shops, whenever I could find them, just to yeah. check out the ambiances, and it's been good, man. I'll tell you, we don't get weather like this a lot in London, so this is a this is a real treat. So yeah, definitely. I hope uh, you're relishing it. I know I am. Yeah. And it's a good fight week because we have a, it's an interesting card. It's been an interesting week. Yeah. Uh, obviously, top of the bill is AJ and Robert Hellenius. Mm-hmm. Um, Last replacement. Right. But it's, you know, uh, Dillian White, uh, I guess, you know, was had to, had to, uh, was dropped out for, for obvious reasons. Yes. And But the card, it's eight fights. We've got four heavyweight fights on there. Mm-hmm. And one of them, people might ask me asking, you know, Malik Scott, he trains uh, Deontay Wilder. What's he doing here? Yeah. But you also train Gerald Washington. Absolutely. And he's in the chief support with uh, Derek Chisora, a man yes. that you know quite well. Very well. Yes. Yes. So first of all, great to see you. You too, brother. Uh, you look great. How you feeling? What's going on? Talk to me. I feel extremely, extremely blessed for starters. Um, and, and I want to say one thing. I'm happy to see you in good spirits because like I told you when I ran across you the other day, man, so many people was praying for you. And um, it's a such thing as being a, a champion in these boxing rings, but a champion in life. That's what you came back from with that tragic accident. And not just came back from your hair smiling and you're looking good. My and brother. The, and the swag is still on. But uh, I'll tell you, I really appreciate that, man. Yeah. It means a lot to me. It really Big does. time, so man. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Real, I'm real, proud real, of you, real. brother. Thank you. Yes. Um, but speaking of, man, you, you had quite a career, and there's so much that I want to talk to you about. Mm-hmm. You know, people might be wanting to just say, oh, Deontay Wilder, Anthony Jeff, this, well, we can get to that. We yeah. Talk about that, but there's so much more to talk about. Absolutely. First of all, originally from North Philly. Mm-hmm. What a what a part of the world. Now, don't forget, a lot of our audience here is from the UK. They might not understand what a neighborhood like North Philly is like. Mm-hmm. Uh, you were born in 1980, right? Absolutely. So, tell tell us what it was like growing up in the 80s in North Philly. Well. Coming up in North Philly, first thing I think of when I'm thinking of what we came up under, all of us as kids, is poverty. While you're growing through the through, through, through poverty, it's almost like um, you make your relationships, you go to your schools, but there's no escape in that. Because yeah. even the local schools are dealing with the same issues that you're dealing with at home, whether it's... Um, uh, con- constant arguments of issues going on, coming from poverty, um, uh, uh, being a follower, getting into all type of playing dozens with different kids and things like that. But by the grace of God, I have a brother that had a blount disease coming up and his legs is extremely bow-legged and he was kind of overweight as a kid and he used to walk wobbling. So if you're coming up in North Philadelphia, kids doesn't have compassion to want to help you. Of course. But you become the joke. I was always a protector. I didn't let nobody pick on my brother. One day I was in a fight protecting him, uh, and my uncle seen me fighting and said, you gotta take that same energy and channel it into something else. I went to the gym and I was blessed to meet my childhood trainer, Fred Jenkins, and he saved my life. So what do I mean by he saved my life? I was At one time I thought I was gonna be a cool street punk, sell my little drugs, rip and run little streets, be a follower. Fred Jenkins didn't allow that. He told me anything I wanted in life or anything I wanted to do should come from my passion, which was boxing. So he had me film studying as a kid. He had me studying the craft. He was teaching me the craft. He was teaching me how to train people. This was all at a very, very young age. And like the rest is history from there because uh, I, I always commend and thank Fred Jenkins for saving my life because if he didn't, this is a man that used to get out of his bed at two, three in the morning when my mom didn't know where I was at because I was being trying to be a street punk somewhere acting like I was something that I wasn't, which was street. I, even though we came up tough, I come from good people, like, you know what I mean? So, so Fred Jenkins, he really put me in my place as a kid. And this new art has been my craft and my passion for my whole life through all the ups and downs. Uh, one thing that's always stayed faithful to me was boxing. 
And um, I've been rewarding it or giving it back by blessing so many other fighters, so many other kids, so many other just regular clients that I have. And I give them my all. I train them all with the same humility that one would see me train Deontay Wilder with. And um, I've been actually critiqued in that to a sense because people say, bro, you're training these you know, we're regular people the same way you train Deontay. Knowledge is knowledge. I believe in pouring it in. If I see somebody crossing feet the wrong way, I'm saying, uh-uh, mm -hmm. let's drill that. Let's work on that. If I see somebody with their left hand down and they chin up, no, we're going to detail that and get to that. It's the same humility I train the best with. I train everybody with, so. Coming up as a fighter in, in the Northeast Corridor over there, mm -hmm. um, you know, I was born in Baltimore. I used to live in D.C. My yeah. family's from Brooklyn. And You're so right there. I, I'm right there. And I have a lot of family in Philadelphia, right up Germantown Road, in fact. Mm. Used to stop at the Rib Crib. I'm sure you know the yeah. Rib Crib. That's my mother lives around in Germantown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but, uh, yeah, it's just different, right? I mean, the amount of sparring, the stuff you learn, it's just not really stuff you can, it's not stuff you can learn from a textbook or even sometimes people telling you it's something you in the gyms you it's learn gym, especially coming from tricky fighters tough fighters absolutely different di different you, you can explain it but like the tricks of the trade mm -hmm. like really the tricks of the trade because yes. there's a lot of them yes and things you might have never thought but it happened to you mm -hmm. and now you now you know and you took notes of that and now you you're doing it to others and yeah you're doing it to others. Uh, and those same tricks um and those skills and techniques. The beautiful thing about coming up in cities that suffer from, you could say crime and poverty and things like that is because the, 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 the hunger, the nurturing of the hunger becomes so strong that people want to make out make it out of there so bad that they're willing to learn a craft right. and stick to it. So we'll say, we'll use Bernard Hopkins as an example, sure. someone that came out the penitentiary and remained disciplined the whole time. And if we're talking about a pure craftsmanship, fella we have to talk about Bernard Hopkins because he his whole time in boxing he's been living clean he's been working on the small details he's the type of fighter that could fight all the way till he's 50 years old because all he did was work on fundamentals from the old school trainers in North Philadelphia and Germantown that passed it on to him and then he ended up passing it on to young fighters as well and then it just goes on that's how Philadelphia is when it comes to the craft, it's, 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 it's legacy as far as teaching, not as far as accolades. Like, you know what I mean? So it's almost like one thing for sure, a kid from Philadelphia is going to know how to do is fight. He may not be the best fighter in the world, but he's going to know how to defend himself. And that comes from it being a fighting town itself, whether it's with boxing, whether it's with street fighting. Philly is a fighting town. If I could be born or from any other city, I wouldn't be as happy as I am today. I'm happy I was born and raised in North Philadelphia. City of brotherly love. Absolutely. You know, I'll tell you this, uh, here in, in England, I don't know if you've ever been to a place called York Hall. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very famous fight venue here. I've been there. And uh, the United States, we had one, and you fought there. Mm -hmm. And that's called uh, the Blue Horizon. Absolutely. You also fought at, at Boardwalk Hall. Yep. So you fought at some of them storied spots. Yeah, and you, I'm gonna tell you, it was very, very um, surreal to me about that. The most surreal thing to me about that is as a kid, I remember sneaking into the Blue Horizon, not having no money to get in to yep. buy the ticket. And this is Russell Pelt shows. Yeah, I know Russell well. <laughs> so 12, 13 years Yo, later, I'm okay. here fighting it. That's it, yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 12, 13 years later, I'm fighting or headlining at these places, so. It must have just felt great. Oh, extremely well, extremely and, and, well. And, and, and the local, your local fan base coming out. All yeah, proud family, of you. all they right there. And, and they right, like, they're, no, they're right, right there. Right there, that's like, what I was about no, to no, say. They're right yes, there. Yes, <laughs> yes. The Blue Horizon, your people is right there, you can hear everything. That's right. Oh, I watched Bernard Hopkins and Rodney Moore and uh, so many other great fighters from that town. They used to pack that joint out and it would give me goosebumps as a kid watching them come down to the ring, get into the ring and the ring is this small yep. and you, you're right there. It's almost like you could touch them if you wanted to. It's not a bad seat in the house. No, not at all. Not at all. And and even at the top ones, like the old, there were these, they were these old wooden seats, but you're like right, right. on top yes. of the ring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big it was time. A, to me, and, and it was my favorite It spot. would get so crowded. There would be like standing room only and people would actually have no problem going to the Blue Horizon standing. Just, whether they knew it or not, 
not, they was there because of the atmosphere as well as the fight. It's yeah. a fight atmosphere. Yeah, you was. know what I mean? It, it was good, and I had a lot of good experiences there as a fan and as a fighter. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm wondering, first of all, I love what you said about B-Hop, and, and he is an alien, mm -hmm. you know, fighting at 50 the way he did. Yeah. And he still looks like he's in fight shape, to be honest. Yes. He's in great shape even to this day. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you're right. I mean, you see certain guys... Uh, like Roy Jones, who was amazing, but Roy was so gifted athletic. Athletic. He could just almost just do whatever. Yeah, absolutely. B-Hop really had to know the fundamentals, the mm -hmm. details, those little precision moves. Mm -hmm. and, and if I had to pick one that I will always rather have and always rather teach, it will always be a fundamental base because every almost every fighter that I like or every fighter that I study or film study or slow day work down so I could really catch the details. These are fighters that you never see crossing feet. These are fighters that you always see with their hands in good position. These are fighters that even as time went on, if they was to have a conversation with you, you understand every word that they're saying because their defense was intact. Right, sweet like science. Like the sweet science. Now, is this why, because you know, obviously you went by the moniker King, but you also went by mm -hmm. the moniker the noble artist. Mm -hmm. And is this, is this where you got that? Yeah, big time. Just because my love for the craft and um, I believe in doing everything for a reason in the boxing ring. And um, and it's the noble art. Like, there's nothing like it. The business aspect of it, of boxing, is it's the greatest show on earth, in my opinion. But the fundamental part about it and the craftsmanship part about it, that's my favorite part because I'm a geek. I'm a nerd for the sport. Um, all I do is watch crime shows and boxing. My life is extremely boring. I don't care what you see on these pictures. When I, when I leave the lab and I go home, my girl will tell you, I go right to my man cave. You already know the cigars is going. Talking to AJ Fernandez. Uh, for, yes, you know what I mean? And I'm chopping my notes down. I'm studying fighters. I'm going back to Georgie Benton, who was an extremely, extremely Philly shell king. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, and the things he used to do with his hips. I, 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 I call a lot of uh, Philadelphia's, um, Philadelphians, uh, fighters, they left hook. I call it the left. They, uh, he has an incredible left hip because most Philadelphia fighters are extremely violent with their hips. And what that mean? That means that a lot of knockouts is given because they're turning their shots all the way over. Joe Frazier could knock your head off your shoulder with a left hook because of his left hip. He would take his left hip and put through that window right there. So he's taking everything with it. Um, and I noticed a lot of Philadelphia fighters do that as well. And that's things that I've learned as I've gotten older. Bernard Hopkins was a very, very heavy-handed puncher. It was underrated because he didn't get a lot of knockouts. But when guys left the ring from fighting him, they never was the same. Right. They never was the same. And that come from zoning in on details, making sure you're turning your punches over, making sure your chin is down, taking time out to drill boring. And most fighters nowadays don't like to drill boring because if you could do drills and work through boredism, in my opinion, you could be focused through a fight, whether it's eight, 10, or 12 rounds, because nobody wants to do boring drills, nobody. And to me, there's no fighter in the world that's bigger than a drill. I don't, if I tell Deontay, we just step into your left this round, he's gonna to step to his left for a whole round. I'm saying it for a reason. Yeah, it may start off like boom, boom, boom. That's all I'm doing is stepping to my left. Yeah, but you're doing it the proper way. If you're stepping to your left, that means what hand should be up? Your left hand. If you're stepping to your right, that means your right hand should be up. The best punch in boxing, people say, is what? The jab. The jab, and the most important punch. So in my opinion, that means that if any punch you know how to defend from, it should be a jab. The world know that the best punch in boxing, or the most important punch in boxing, is a jab. So your jab defense should be that much better. And them, those are the type of things I like to work on. It's not real scientific, but it's very um, complex because it's so many fighters that don't do these things. You know how many fighters I watch get knocked out with left hooks? Why they're throwing left hooks? Because I call it in a sense of... Don't hook with a hooker. Don't hook with a hooker. Like you're thinking the world owe you something that you could just punch somebody with a hook and you don't have to hold yourself accountable and have your right hand up while you're hooking. And I watch great fighters get knocked out with these shots all the time. And it's because of they caught up in the rapture of everything they want to do to somebody and forgetting that the same thing can be done to them. You can't have an ego in boxing to a certain extent. You have to be confident, but you can't have an ego. There's no drill that a fighter should be bigger than. No drill. This is, these are great points, and I'm agreeing with a lot of things you're saying here. Um, but boxing, if, if anyone out there has ever done it, it will humble you very quick. Mm-hmm. You see those these videos of those kids coming in off the street. They want to be tough guys. They want to 
They want to. They think they could beat somebody up till they go in there. Yes. You 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 get your ass kicked no matter who you are. It doesn't Ab- matter. Absolutely. And, and if there's no fighter that can beat you up, your, your trainer will kick your ass. Yeah, big time. So it, it's it's, it, it's <laughs> and there's so many humbling, videos of this stuff. It's a very humbling experience to to box, but it's also a great thing because uh, you do gain so much self confidence and knowledge, and, mm-hmm. and of course, uh, uh, you know, physicality. But it, speaking of the, that, that, that left hook that Joe Frazier had, he actually hit me with one one time. You met Joe? Oh, yeah. Oh, I met Joe several times, but oh, I had bro. dinner with him one time in New York mm-hmm. uh, with Chuck Zito. Yes. And when he was leaving, I held the door for Joe, and boom, he got me in the stomach. Now, obviously, not full on. He was joking. It was, but could you feel it? It oh, was one of those things that he hit you. It was like, a love tap, but right, I could feel, feel. it. Oh, he absolutely. wanted to. Right. 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 <laughs> yeah, he was a lovely guy. Yes. But speaking of getting knocked out with a left hook, let's talk about you and Deontay. Yes. Check this out. Mm-hmm. If you watch that fight, which I'm sure you have, you know, I'm sure you've watched it. Mm-hmm. You lived it. It was a one-two. It was a left and a right. The right yes. was devastating, but it didn't land no the hook did it, the hook did the hook did yeah the left hook just yeah. like you're talking about Tell on my about temple that. so how can i put this anytime we'll say chisora we'll say tony thompson guys that look like they can't really punch but they're big men yeah. we'll even put deontay in this bit in this mix but he can punch anytime i've ever been knocked down it's always been with a temple shot every time if you see my fight when I fought Tony Thompson, <clears throat> he hit me with a shot that didn't even look hard. But I'm sorry, the only thing I can remember is hearing boom and then looking up right. at him. Okay. Chisora hit me with a nice overhand right, about right there. All I can remember is the ref in my face. Deontay, it just so happens that the real story is two months or three months before we fought, I left Tyson Fury's training camp and went directly to Deontay's training camp. Tyson Fury was giving me, was giving me, he gave me great work, like great work. I would say he got the best of those rounds. And this one when Fury was Fury, herky-jerky, would hit you with shots that he wasn't as vulnerable as he is now. Now he give you an opportunity to hit him. The Fury I used to box didn't do that. From there I went to Alabama and boxed Deontay. The fr- uh, say the third round, he hit me with a right hand in sparring. I went down. This is with 20 ounces on. So I knew when we fought, I couldn't get hit with his right hand. My attention was so much on his right hand yeah, that my hands right. was up straight here, and he got a slap and hook around. But a slap and hook from Deontay <clears throat> is something that knocked Eric Molina down. It's something that hurt. I was um, that fight. I was yeah. ringside. I was in Alabama. Yes, yeah, it was. You yeah. was there, Hunter? I was there. Yeah. yeah. So he has a good left hook. His right hand just get a lot of attention like it should because it's God given. But his hook hit me and it locked my equilibrium off. And we'll say for the sake of allegations and how it looked, um, how can I put this? Most people say, man, people hate on you, people this. I really wouldn't say that. People expected a lot out of me. I got hit with a slap and left hook that I couldn't recover from. So any disagreeing or any kind of criticism that I got from that fight, I deserved it and I wear it well. The same way I would wear it well if I hit somebody else with a hook and they went down. There's no really ins and out with me after that fight. Um, it didn't tarnish me and Deontay relationship. We still supported each other as brothers as we went into the fight. And um, the rest is history. But um, that's something that happened to me, not just once, but a few times um, that happened a part of my journey. And, and um, you could say I, I, I took those kind of shots. And when I say that shots, I mean in life. I took those kind of shots. And you just got to keep on going. I didn't get discouraged about, because I think three months from there, I was in Australia. And I was beating one of the best Australian heavyweights. Leopard. Leopard. And life goes on. You know what I mean? So, so this is another thing I wanted to talk about. So first of all, a lot of people don't know, or they might not know, you were a hell of an amateur. Yes. You had a great amateur career. Had a great amateur you career. You just missed out on the Olympics. Yes. But you had a great amateur career. Mm-hmm. So you are a very well school fighter. Mm-hmm. Um, and I believe you are in a great position to be a great trainer because you have that knowledge. You know, you were bestowed upon that knowledge and the coaching tree continues. Absolutely. Um, and But you, you have danced with a lot of these guys at, at the higher weight class. Mm-hmm. And so you also have the experience of actually being in the ring with them which puts you in a very, very interesting position to be a trainer. But I do want to say, you're 35 and 0. Mm-hmm. You have this fight with Glasgow, right? Yes. It, at Huntington, I, I remember this fight. Yes. And 
a lot of people thought you won that fight. Yeah. And you got a draw. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the first, it's not a blemish, but first kind of blemish. Yes, I, I would say blemish. Yes. Yes. So the first blemish, and right after that is the, not right after that, but right after that is the Chisor fight. Yes. That, that you take your first loss. Yeah, and that was here. Yes. Yeah. Now that's, and so I wanted to also talk about this fight. Because yes. Because you did get hit with the, the overhand right on the temple, like you said. But the, the Chisora loss, in my opinion, um, even right then and there when it happened, the way I deal with life, Dave, it, it comes across as a, in a nonchalant way. But I deal with my own issues the best way. So if I'm in a situation, I always look immediately to what I could have done to make that situation better or not happen. What I could have done in that fight was get up at eight. But I thought you, not to be whatever. Yes. And I'm not trying to throw anyone under the bus. Yes, yes, yes. Because I know the referee mm -hmm. uh, and I have a lot of respect. Yes. But when I watched it, I thought you beat the count. I, 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 mean, I thought you, just as a fan yeah. watching it, I thought you beat the count. And not only that, you were... You looked very ready to go. Yeah, yeah, I was ready. And and I and literally technically did I beat the count? Yes. But now let's look at life and not have mirror issues. So this was the real thing. I come to somebody's country. I'm winning in a fight. And, you, and that's another thing. Right. You were boxing really nice. Right. And but then I put myself in a position in someone else's country to give them a reason to right, take it right, from me. Right. And, and look, that's fair. And yeah. I like that cuz cuz Fuck excuses. Absolutely, you can't. Sorry, you can't get. Me, you you can't. You can't get up at nine. Well, you yeah. know what I mean. You can't get up at eight and a half. You did against Wilder. Absolutely, <laughs> and that's like in that fight. But, I, but right, it, anything in my scenario, I look at it like you. I, you should always want to give yourself the best opportunity that nothing can be taken from you. And if I could do it over, I would have got up a lot totally, earlier. A hundred percent. I love what you're saying. I agree, but. Be that as it may, I, you beat the count. And Absolutely, you, and you looked ready to go. Yes, and I was. So it, it, and I thought, you know, you were doing really well in the fight. Yeah, I was winning the fight. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I, I don't. But the scorecards read, but you were boxing really nice. Look, Chisora yes. had his moments, mm -hmm. and and we know you don't get surprised with Chisora. You know, you know who Chisora is. You know what he wants to do. He's very transparent physically He's and verbally. Yes, right. you, we know what we're gonna get with him. But but you were tying him up on the inside real yes. well, mm -hmm. and you were you were boxing real nice from the outside when you yeah. got your range. And he had moments. Again, he had moments in the fight, but yeah. I do think you were doing very very well. Yes, I was doing very well, and I beat the count but in hindsight you can't give nobody a reason to take nothing from you in this business you just can't no i agree with that you so know now I mean? so now you come out of there and now you get the loss with deontay mm -hmm. your last fight was in monaco against king kong yes ortiz um, i was tripping off of him what do i mean by i was tripping off him ortiz he did a a, a, a Oh, he did a monster job on uh, Brian Jennings, who's also from North Philadelphia, I know and, and me and Bye Bye Jennings. Bye Bye Jennings, and I think the world of Bye Bye Jennings. And I just looked at, at that fight. That was a, the sort of fight I stayed at because to me, to me, that's the best Luis Ortiz. That fight, and I knew I had to stay away from his left hand, and I knew I had to stay away from his left uppercut to the body. But as things go in life, guess what I do? I get hit immediately with the straight left hand and I get knocked down with the left uppercut to the body. And that's the overthinking aspect. I should have went in there, fought my game plan. My game plan was to move, but no, I was in flight. I wasn't trying to engage at all. And it calls for a horrible show. And um, uh, it was so horrible that even Luis Ortiz, I made him really look bad. That's probably his worst performance as far as the way he looked. And that's because I just was using directional feints on him, moving, 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 and put myself in a position not to be offensively effective. And that cost me a loss and a very bad loss. Why did you decide after that to hang it up? I really didn't decide to hang it up, but this is a lesson for all young fighters coming up right here. In boxing, boxing is about performance when it comes to your stock. If your stock is not up, it's going to be extremely hard for you to get fights when you was at a high level and you shit it on shows and now your stock is down here and you're saying, wait, 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 I want to fight, I want to fight. No promoters want to take chances with you. Nobody want to really be a part of you. By the grace of God, I, I just always been a geek, so I'm going to be in boxing regardless of my performance in a boxing match. I can always be a manager, I can always be a future Hall of Fame trainer like I'm aiming to be, like I'm going to be. And that's just what it was. I just looked at it like, um, 
I've had tons of opportunities that God blessed me with. Some opportunities I made the best out of, but the most important ones, I didn't rise to the occasion like I should have, and it cost me. And that's, it's no one to blame for those type of situations but myself. But was, I just, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around your, what was going on in your mind at the time Mm -hmm. After you've been boxing since you're again, you're, you're still in the sport. Yes. So, so it's not like you left the sport. Right. But as a fighter, as a fighter, though, mm -hmm. from 11, 10, 11 years old. Because after after the Ortiz fight, I could not get no action. I got frustrated. So it wasn't that you decided, oh, mm -hmm. it's just you couldn't, no. you couldn't get played. So much time, <clears throat> so much time went on after that that I just couldn't get another fight. But during that time, I was training people. I still was training. So I looked at it like, um... So it was almost like a natural transition. It was a, very natural, very natural. Teaching has always been natural with me because Fred Jenkins raised us like that, to be not just fighters, but to teach each other, to train each other yes. coming up. Yes. So I just carried that with me. Yes. And um, the position I'm in now, I tell Deontay all the time I'm forever indebted to him because he believed in me at a time where nobody would have paid to see me in that position or wanted me in that position to be his head trainer in the most important fight of his life. Not only did he hire me, but he told me why he's hiring me, why he believed in me, and where he see my future at as a Hall of Fame trainer in this game. Once he told me that, that was really like my push to say, okay, now it's time to start giving back. So that's what I do now, I just give back all my knowledge. I teach in full detail. I teach from the feet up. I believe in mixing boxing with Wing Chun. I believe in mixing boxing with some of Muay Thai moves. Anything that keep fighters I'm training defensively safe, but also have a good offense. That's what I'm doing for guys. Got to be in position. Absolutely, because if you're not in good position, then whatever punches you're throwing don't mean absolutely nothing. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, I know you and Deontay have a much deeper relationship than just trainer yes my brother boxer absolutely tell us how you guys first met and what that kind of road has been like we met i believe 2010 i believe 2010 we was um i ended up in this training camp with thomas adamick i was the only one near boxing thomas adamick very hell of a fighter hell of a he fighter. was kind of in in that in between weight right? yes there was no bridger weight right because he came up he was a smaller guy he but he's trying to get guy, the big big fights and big money so I, I and, and they told me the day before they got they said we got one more guy coming in. I don't know if you know him, named Deontay Wild. Of course I know him. I'm a geek. When he came, we clicked right off the rip. My family came up to Pennsylvania. This was in the Poconos. He cooked for me and my family. He took to my son. Me and him was boxing adamant together, strategizing every day. And from there, we just became very close. Even when we separated in training camp right there, I would go down to Alabama. He would come to L.A. Um, our families and everything will talk. My mom birthday is on his birthday. His mom birthday is on my birthday. Crazy. And just the irony of all these things just worked out for us. That's and, um, crazy. You know, that's my brother. Um, and I love him to death. Uh, I personally really like Deontay too. I've got to spend some time with him. He's, he's just a really nice guy. Mm -hmm. And um, he's out in L.A. now, too, right? Well, he has a spot in L.A. He has a spot. He got houses all over the place, sure, but he does. Sure. Him and his family, um, they have a spot in uh, Los Angeles, California. It's a beautiful home. Um, he, he, he blueprinted the whole place and set it all up and built it from the ground up and everything. So it's good, man. And uh, uh, the one thing I really appreciate about him the most is not just as a trainer or as a friend, he bring me into his meetings, he shared things with me, he introduced me to people. So just not that I'm just gonna be a great trainer, but now I'm looking at myself to be possibly a great manager for other fighters coming up. And that's what I'm doing now, I'm going in that direction, managing and training fighters. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. I do wanna ask you this because, you know, Deontay obviously is a hell of a fighter, he's a hell of a puncher. Yes. But. A lot of people, when they think of Deontay, they don't think of him as like this you know, incredible boxer. Right. But I've heard you speak very highly of him. You think he's one of the best that's ever been. Absolutely. He's the most dynamic fighter in the history what of the sport. What do you mean by that? What I mean by that is when it comes to speed and being extremely wiry and having the type of power and speed he have with his body makeup, it's just God, it's God given and God gifted. 
And the things that I've seen him do in drills, the things that I've seen him do in sparring to grown men that weigh over 230 pounds, it's just shocking to me. I've never seen that like it in my life. Um, Deontay, I've watched Deontay make grown men have seizures from sparring. I watched him send guys to emergency room. I've watched him outbox guys in sparring. I watched him use every attribute that I know that he can do. He actually have shown it to me. You know, this going to sound very... um conceded in a way as far as how I feel about his full ability, but I even believe that Deontay should be on the pound for pound list. He's not just one of the best heavyweights of all time to me. If he really, really wanted to and he really wanted to focus and continue to drill and continue to strategize with me, I believe he's one of the best pound for pound fighters overall. It was all about him just having humility and a bunch of discipline and being defensively responsible and he'll never lose another fight again. I truly believe that in my heart. Speaking of things he's done to people, you had to have reconstructive surgery for holding the mitts, yeah? Absolutely. I'm working on my right shoulder right now. Actually, my doctor told me less than another year he'd give me that my right shoulder, I'm, I'm, I'm going to need a whole reconstructive surgery, surgery on my shoulder. Speaking of injuries, I know during your boxing career you had, a, was it a bicep injury? I had two bicep injuries, uh, one calf, one calf, ruptured calf, two fractures, one broken hand. Um, concussions, everything, man. You know, I pay my dues in this, and um, that's why I'm extremely confident as far as this trainer job. I've never been this confident with anything in my life. I'm telling you this right now. I'm going to be a future Hall of Fame trainer. I'm going to train other young fighters to be future Hall of Fame trainers, and I'm going to continue to elevate the game. I may never be come trainer of the year or anything like that, but one thing for sure, I guarantee you people will say Malik Scott has always elevated the boxing game concerning fundamentals and skills. And that's my goal. I'm happy with that. Who else do you guys have out there? Was it uh, the, the, the boxing gym out in uh, California? Uh, it's a beautiful facility, the best gym in the world as far as I'm concerned. It's called Brick House Boxing Gym in North Hollywood. It's a real family orientated gym. A bunch of real fighters are there. They're, even the, the pure clients that's there, they train as if they're getting ready for actual real fights. We have Coach Julian there, who's a beautiful boxing mind. We have myself, we have Coach Joe Sway there as well. We have so many different good teachers there that whatever it is that somebody, somebody is coming there to learn, they can learn there at Brickhouse Boxing. If your girl want to work out, uh, we have trainers there that Josue do an incredible job with her as well as with other pro fighters. If, if a pro fighter want to come there and just maintenance his, his base, you come to Malik Scott, I'm going to take you to another level. If you want to maintenance your base and become de more defensively responsible and offensively, Coach Julian, who's worked with Zero Ramirez right now, who works with uh, uh, Johnny Ramirez right now, um, uh, AKA Scrap, who's a future flyweight champion of the world. And it's just, it's, it's a beautiful place. It's very family orientated. It's real fighters there, it's real clients there. It's not a huge gym, but it's very, it's very, very, very sufficient. Very sufficient, I'm and happy I'm a part of it. What does it take for you to, I love how your approach to train when you say it doesn't matter if it's, if it's you know, a, a white collar boxer, or if it's Deontay Wilder. Or Every, everybody get the same humility. I love yes. that. And that's how, you know, one of my keys to success always was taking these little four-rounders at a leisure center. Yes. As, as seriously as I take, you know, a heavyweight uh, main event or a, or a fight at Madison Square Garden. Mm -hmm. that, 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 you know, I attack them all the same way. Yeah. But how do you decide to take on a fighter? For example, Gerald Washington. Yes. You know, look. Gerald, we know who Gerald is. Yes. Gerald's a great guy. Yes. A uh, tough guy, but, you know. And he did a whole lot in a short period of time. It's very, very rare you get a, a, a college graduate at the age of over, we'll say, 25 that come into boxing, fight for a heavyweight title, put himself right in uncomfortable territories by boxing high-level guys that's better than him. I want to speak on some. Also, in sparring, Gerald Washington is the first person that ever knocked me down when he really didn't know nothing. He just was a strong guy and John Pullman had him ready and they worked on fundamentals. I, I've known Gerald for almost, we're going on almost a decade now. You know what I mean? So we, I, we co I come up boxing, but now I'm his trainer as well. So I know I'm like the back of my head. Um, he's 10 times more better than what people think. Um, Saturday night, I can't wait for people to see the job he's going to do on, on Chisora. And then after that, I want Gerald Washington to fight Andy Ruiz, and that's my aim. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I can, look, it's an exciting night of fights. Absolutely. And uh, I can't wait to see uh, 
all this stuff. Or will you be doing a little bit of scouting on AJ? I know you got a, you got a little eye open. You watching what's going on over there. It's simple. AJ and Deontay, we'll, we'll just match opponents. When AJ fights Dominique Brazil, he looked incredible to me, but he looked incredible the AJ way. What's the AJ way? In my opinion, no heavyweight in the world put punches together in combinations like he do. He need to get back to that. What's the Deontay Wilder way? One hit a quitter. He's going to set you up. He's going to orchestrate and put you in a position where he can land the missile. They both are very explosive in their own way. The advantage to me Deontay has is my brain is behind him. He has a pure geek behind him. He has JDs behind him, Cuz Hill, and we have an incredible team. And we're willing to put ourselves at risk or we're willing to put our job at risk just to make sure he do the right thing and keep himself defensively responsible and not put his knee in front of, not put his chin in front of his left knee, not cross feet too much. Make sure his hands in good position. Use every aspect of his God given ability all the time throughout the rounds and stay alert. I believe if him and AJ fight in January, it's a three to four round fight. I believe Deontay wins by a devastating knockout. That doesn't say anything bad about AJ, but it just says how special Deontay Wilder is, like I'm always telling everybody. But what happens with a guy if he falls in love too much with his power? Like let's let's talk about the King Kong fight for yes. a second. It, not your fight with him, but, yes. but Deontay's, Deontay's. He was basically losing every moment of that fight Till he sparked the guy. You want to know what's crazy about today? Because the first fight to me was extremely f fan friendly and TV friendly. That's not even my favorite fight, though. My favorite fight of Deontay is Ortiz too. So why do I say that? Most people say, well, how was that your favorite fight? And he was losing. It's because the way he was respecting Ortiz. Right. In boxing, when a fighter respects another fighter, it's shunned upon. Oh, he's respecting them too much. No, but when you're a killer and you're respecting someone too much, it's a good thing because it's almost like if I was to put it in another language, it's saying, oh, he's just setting him up. To set someone up, you have to respect them. Ortiz deserved respect. Deontay gave it to him and then took him in deep waters and drowned him. Before you know it, it was lights out. He shut off all his, his faculties and he just went down. He's going to respect AJ when they fight. So That's a bad thing for AJ. He's setting traps. Absolutely, absolutely. From a respect standpoint. I understand. Well, well, I know I can't go straight at this guy. I gotta have my high hand up. I can't go to him like this because AJ has a good straight right hand. So I have to treat him accordingly. Long as Deontay treat fighters accordingly, continue to drill, continue us strategizing and, uh, and allow us to orchestrate these knockouts together, He'll never lose another fight. He's going to knock out AJ, and then he's going to get the Fury Wilder for a fight, and then knock out Fury if they ever fight again, which I'm pushing for. Woo! Yes. A lot of great boxing. To yes. Come, <laughs> and I can't wait to see it. All. Absolutely, brother. You know, yes. I love it. Listen, I appreciate you taking the time to to sit down and speak to me. Um, I couldn't we wait. Do, we do have some fan questions. Are you okay to answer a couple fan questions? Yes, I'm more yeah, than okay. We got, we got some time for that? Yeah, man. Couple. Yep. All right, cool. Our producer's off camera going, oh, you got to cut it. Got to cut son. it. We're going I in. I told you he'd be doing Jeez. that. Jeez. Right. I got to talk about boxing with this dude all the time. All right, let's see here. Hold on. Uh, fan questions. All right, let's go. Jackie Wright asks, does Deontay's punch power compare with anyone else in boxing you've ever been chin checked with or on the pads? Uh, the closest one to Deontay's power is Lennox Lewis. I was boxing Lennox Lewis at a very young age. I had about five professional fights. His assistant was training me, which was Harold Knight, which was Emmanuel Stewart's assistant. The closest one is Lennox Lewis. But it's another fighter, stylistically, that he's the only fighter that actually reminds me of Deontay. And that's the great legendary Felix Savone from Cuba. Mm. He, he was an extremely, extremely vicious, vicious man with his high hand up in the way he... He was so vicious. No one knocks out David Tua with no, no head gear on. No, no, no. Felix Savone no. knocked out David Tua and stopped him. Every heavyweight that came from America during the, we'll say, late 80s, 90s, all the way up to 2000s, Felix Savone knocked him out. Knocked and, him out. And he could box. And he could box. He was very good deep, off the back foot. Deep boxing mind. Yes, yes, yes. yes. That's the closest thing to Deontay, in my opinion, Felix Savone. But as far as power, I would say Lennox Lewis is close. But Lennox Lewis power was thudding. Deontay's is striking. Striking. It's striking. Different. Di yes. Different. Yeah. I'll tell you that that jab of Lennox Lewis, you know, whether oh. you love him or hate him, I mean, his jab is like a power punch. Absolutely. He's my favorite, great, greatest fighter of all time, and in my opinion. he is opinion. one of the best heavyweights. Of, of all. One of the best heavyweights of all time. Absolutely. He did everything in a boxing ring one man can do. You know, he, he really was incredible. Um, shout out to Lennox. Um, Peter Francis asks, Malik, man, 
dot dot interested to know comma heart on hand comma what happened in monte carlo against luis ortiz man mm -hmm. i guess we talked about that good can i answer it again yeah go ahead go yeah. ahead absolutely what happened with ortiz was like i said i was tripping off of him i was studying him so much and i knew his dangers his danger advantages so much and i went into the fight overthinking my game plan Just was cerebral my, yes my game plan was to move but once i felt his power especially to the body and he had hit me with a good temple shot i decided to stay on my bicycle i some some people would say it was gutless i probably would agree some people say it was extremely smart to not get knocked out like that i probably wouldn't go with that i would say you know it was a d minus gutless performance knowing that how it went down and especially uh, i'm glad that you clarified to me because i was like you know, you were 35-0, and 0, mm -hmm. then you had that controversial draw, you had a controversial loss to Chisora. When I say controversial, the, the stoppage I thought was, was yes. uh, a little bit premature. Mm -hmm. uh, then the Deontay with this, some people want to say it's some phantom punch. It wasn't a fan, it was, it was a very strong left hook. Yes. You know, the right hand would have would have really been a problem, mm -hmm. but it didn't land. Right. But that left was was gnarly. Yeah. Like you said, you 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 woke up later from it, or you know. Yeah. Well, it knocked my. All I remember about that is being hit, and then I'm looking up, and I'm like, oh, and I'm a little stiff. Right. I tried to get up, and my equilibrium was off. Right. And guess what? That wasn't even Deontay's best left hook. It right. was a left hook to set up a right hand. Correct. But it hits me directly on the temple. Yeah. So it's just one of those things, man. But. You know. But but knowing that, like, if you went back into the to, to the Ortiz fight, you would have you would have attacked different this time. Oh, big time! With someone like Ortiz, you have to take chances early, early on because right. it make the mid rounds much easier for you. Sure. Ortiz is a gangster. He's a killer, and the only way to tame gangsters and killers if, is you have to let them know you're not going to be a gangster and killer today. I didn't do that. I allowed him to be himself, and he constantly pressed on. And I made a decision to stay on my bicycle. Yeah. It wasn't the best bravery, but it was the best decision to me that I made that day and if I could do it over I would take chances a whole lot earlier I don't know if you just saw the fight we had in New Orleans with Zaria fought uh, Regis Progray yes it's a kind of a similar thing I mean and Zaria has some punching power yes but he just stayed on his bike and it was really kind of a stinker of a fight uh, yes I've seen that it, but things happen yeah Sometimes things happen happens. yeah and that's it, that, that's the beauty of this noble art because um I could see Michael Spinks in my opinion, give one of the greatest heavyweights of all time, Larry Holmes, two losses back to back. And then I could see Michael Spinks get into the ring and walk to the ring with Mike Tyson and look extremely terrified. 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 Yes. Real quick, Michael Spinks was walking to the ring and someone said, go get him. Go get him, Mike. You know what Mike said to the fan? I'll try. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. The mentality you were not into that fight. I remember that fight like yesterday, man. Me too. I remember that fight like yesterday. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and when he went in there and got hit, oh. um, he went down from the very first shot. But I really think it was a mentality. Did the, did the punch land? Absolutely it did. Is Mike Tyson an extremely hard puncher? Yes. But what Michael Spinks made of him before he even got in the ring, it made the punch even more harder. I, fe I felt like a lot of people did that. Frank Bruno, to me, looked terrible yes. going in. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and Spinks was a... Sphinx was gnarly, dude. Yes. The Sphinx jinx, baby. Oh, and Leon was extremely and awkward. I mean, yes. Yeah, both guys, you know. Mm hmm All right, let's see here. Uh, Orco underscore 89 asks, what attributes in particular do you look for when you're approached to take on a fighter to train? They balance. Um, I look I look for the bad habits in their feet because I believe, every, I think, I just believe that everything in boxing should be taught from the feet up because I'm a man of good positioning. I believe if you're not in a good position, it doesn't matter what punch you try to throw or what punch you try to land, it's not gonna be an effective punch. But to drill feet and to drill foundation, people have to be willing to drill boring. Most fighters don't want to drill boring because they look at themselves like they're bigger than the drill, yeah. which is absolutely false. Yeah. You're not big drill boring on your off days, your recovery days. You should just be working on steps, being able to know how to step to your left, step to your right, step forward and step back and be effective doing all of those things. You'd be surprised at how many fighters get lost just because someone make them step to their right. You'd be surprised how many fighters become limited because someone make them step to their left or cut their right side off. I watch high level fights where fighters are still going for feints to the body. Why are you reaching down here when somebody going to your body? When I, the minute I see a fighter throwing a jab to the body, I already know he's setting up a left hook. 
immediately. If I see if I see a fighter jabbing a fighter bicep, I already see a straight right hand coming. If I see a fighter throwing a left hook, I already know he's setting up a cross right hand. If I see a fighter fainting a lot, I already know he's waiting for his guy to overcommit. That's because my studies is five steps ahead of the move. That's right. Because I look at fights in very slow motion. You know what I mean? I drill boring mentally when I'm film studying. But uh, you know, to me, this is anything but boring. This is this is the devil's in the details. This is what makes it so amazing. Absolutely, brother. And and you know, like when I first started boxing, my trainer wouldn't even let me hit the bag, let alone spar. I Absolutely. just wanted to get in and start fighting. He's like, no, no, it doesn't work like that. Yes. I had to sit in front of a mirror and learn how to throw a jab and learn how to throw certain things only in the mirror. Yes. Finally, after a long time, to, then we moved to the bag. Mm -hmm. When and, we. By and, the and, time we started sparring, said, so, "Oh, that's why we're doing this." And it's very, very minimum teachers nowadays that believe in drill and boring. I, uh, my good friend from a million styles of boxing—I don't know if you guys know him. His name is Barry Robinson. Okay. He's an international trainer, and what I mean by that is he don't go with the status quo of you could say nowadays society of trainers, boxing trainers. He believe in drilling, boring. He believe in studying the dynamics of a move. And he gave me a lot of understanding of things that I already knew. But I, but I didn't understand the dynamics of it. His name is Barry Robs. He's 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 beyond a good teacher. He's someone that uh, you could say I look up to. Someone that shares information with me, have taught me so much about controls, details, distance, feet cross, and everything like that. So everything I get from the Barry Robinsons of the world, the Emmanuel Stewart's when I was coming up, the Fred Jenkins when I was a kid. Every day I'm in the gym watching Coach Julian. You know, what make me dangerous is the environments that I'm around that I'm a sponge for. That's what make me a dangerous trainer for the future. I love that. Mm -hmm. I love that. Even, you know, when I first started to play drums, I, yeah. I wanted to get on a drum set. Yes. No. You no. don't even get a snare drum. Right. You get a pad mm. and you start learning the rudiments. Flange. Rudiments. Paradiddles. Single stroke roll. Yes. Double stroke roll. Five stroke roll. Seven stroke roll. Now, when you listen to a great jazz mm -hmm. artist, all you're hearing is rudiments around the kit. Uh huh. But they, Absolutely. But they know them so well. Yes. Because they drilled them. Those boring drills. Yes. You know? Yeah. And yeah. The footwork. I mean, you know, when guys fight, they say they dance. It's it's a dance of footwork. And you got to so realize important. something. We, we're in a time where people, good footwork to me is not the Ali Shuffle. Good footwork to me is not copycat and Roy Jones. Good footwork to me. It could be the individual behind this camera that know how to go to his left and throw a jab and throw a right hand and throw a hook. And he know how to do that same aspect moves going to his right. He know how to do that stepping back. And he know how to do that coming forward. That's good footwork. But nowadays, you could just turn on YouTube and look at highlight reels yeah. and think that's development. When it's not, you yeah. could play copycat. Copycat is not the way. It's the way when you're fighting D minus guys, but the minute that you step up yep. to the highest level, you're going to get physically called out on it, and guys is going to lose fights. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and, and like you say, the, the footwork. I mean, and balance. It's everything. I mean, where does where does a, a, a punch come from? You know, your pinky toe all the way up, uh -huh. right? and all the way through. That's yes. right. So yes. it's from the ground up, like you're saying, from the from absolutely. Look, Scott. Scott's freaking out off camera. He's I know, and man. I'm not acting like it's I don't cool. see him. <laughs> I love it. That's good. <laughs> but we still got a couple more. Yep. Okay, um, let us work, Scott. Let us work, brother. La la last question here. <laughs> All right, Rolo ha uh, hyphen B train asks: Does Malik Scott have any other business interests outside of boxing? I'd be interested to hear. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I I, I want to go, and I already start putting my foot into the to, to the tobacco business. Um, oh, talk, let's talk about that. Can, yes. You know, by the way, when when when. Uh, uh, our producer said, hey, you know, can we do Malik? I said, absolutely, let's, let's do Malik. I guess Malik said, Scott, can we smoke? I said, immediately, oh, man. Immediately. I was so excited. I yeah. said, I would love to get, uh, sit down with Dave as long as we can smoke our cigars. So you're going down to Nicaragua, you're telling me. Yes, I fly into Managua. Um, I get a car. Drive up about three or four hours to Esteli. I stay up there. I do my own blends. Um, I listen to the ones that paved the way before me concerning the other brands, Padron, uh, Padermo, um, uh, Rocky Patel, and I listened to all these guys, Craig Cunningham, who makes an incredible uh, cigar, construction it very well, it's called the Chupacata, and these guys, they helped me with my own blends, and um, this is something that I want to take part in as well, and something else that's extremely boring, but it means a lot to me, I haven't been able to put my foot in it yet, is I want to travel the world and help out, um, how, how would you say, um, the less fortunate, but not just help them out from a distance with finances. I really want to get into the 
into the mix with them. Um, if it, we'll hypothetically say, if I'm talking about the skid row, I want to be very, very hands on with adding on humility and adding on assistance and help from this boxing world to help others. And I don't, I don't know if that's considered a business, but that's exactly where my heart is at. So during my training and during my hall of fame years that I have coming up from being a, a great trainer, you guys is going to be seeing me all over around the world in Dominican Republic, helping domestic violence women out, helping kids out, helping the homeless out and building structures for them to, uh, you know, push forward well in life. Um, I'm a very boring dude, Dave. I don't, I don't have too many things that I really want to do. But I'm not good at business at all. I'm not good at business at all. I need, I have help for that. Like, you know what I mean? I'm not good with, um, what do you call it? Not a uh, minute. Yes, that is it. Administrative type of things. I'm working on it, but I'm not good at it. You know, I, I like to watch my crime shows, study fight films, and focus on the little passions of things that I have. And one of the passionate things that I'm very much into is helping the less fortunate out, helping d domestic violence cases out. And I'm interested in doing it, not just in the States, but all over the world. Well, Esteli is a, it's a place I've visited many times. I've yeah. been down there for a long time. Yeah, we got to go together one time, man. That'll I'll mean the world it. to me. I got me. some friends over there at the Drew Estate. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've been on the Drew Estate. They, that whole Drew Estate, it changed the whole city down there. Yes. Because it, it was a very agricultural town. It still is an agricultural town. Mm -hmm. It used to be a San Anisa stronghold, but... Um, but but the Drew Estate facility is just massive, and of course, Padrones down there. And yes. they're making some great, great cigars yes. down there. It's big un time, unbelievable, big time. Really humble, beautiful people, and some yes. really good fighters from Nicaragua too. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, coming from Philadelphia, I know you've seen a lot of the videos from Kensington and these other places. Yes, and also Los Angeles. You know what's going on there. Yes, we all know what's going on there. So there are a lot of people that need help. So I, I love that you're doing that, and uh, I love just sitting down and having a dialogue with you. This was everything I thought it would be. And um, uh, one of the things I admire about you the most before sitting down with you is, I love to sit down with people that I consider a champion in life because I don't wanna say it's easy to be a champion in the boxer ring, but compared to the things that you've made it through and, it, and compared to the things that you made it through and still is willing to have that smile and still do this job with such passion, I really admire. I really, really do, man. And I'm proud of you and I can't tell you enough because I know the, the position that you was in from that accident. For you to be right here is, um, you know, we got to give all glory to God for that, man. So, you know, you're a walking testimony and I'm proud of you for it, Amen. brother. Yes. Thank you, King. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate it. Love it. And uh, we'll see you soon. Absolutely. Guys, listen, check it out. This is episode 69. It's a wrap. Malik King Scott, yes. great trainer, former heavyweight. And yes. This weekend, AJ Hellenius. We got a, a great fight with uh, Chisora in Washington. Mm -hmm. And the Dempsey McKean and Hergovich. I can't wait to Me see too. that. The Ron for a Bull going against Dirty Harry for uh, the, the vacant Southern area. Yes. So it's a stacked heavyweight card. So tune in. We'll see you next week from Birmingham. Checking out now Matchroom Ready with David Diamante and Malik Scott. Yes.